Okay, that's an introduction to power plants and the profitability and how spreads are connected to the profitability of power plants. And this is also already bridging the gap towards energy trading and portfolio management, which we are discussing here, especially if you're coming from more from an engineering background. This, what we just discussed, these spark spreads already look like financial instruments and as we said they indeed are traded as financial instruments so again simplifying all this complex machinery costing a billion euros in a power plant can be simplified to natural gas goes in that is associated to cost electricity comes out that's associated to revenues We need more financial background to analyze this more profoundly and in particular what we will discuss in the next chapter is options and optionality. You may have heard about options but we will give an introduction and always keep it relevant to energy and electricity and natural gas options. So within the field of energy economics, we use and implement the financial instrument of options. Okay, we'll start describing types of options, then go on with hedging with options, and then we discuss option valuation. Let's introduce a typical plain vanilla call option first. The buyer of a call option has the right, but not the obligation to obtain a certain underlying asset at a predetermined price, the exercise price or strike price in a predetermined quantity within a certain period, that's an American option, or at a certain point in time, that's a European option. So this is the valid definition of an option which goes way beyond energy applications. That's in finance what an option is. Giving the buyer of a call option the right but not the obligation. That's the optionality. You have the right as the buyer but not the obligation. So you can but you don't have to buy a certain underlying asset at a predetermined price and in a predetermined quantity within a certain period or at a certain period in time. The seller on the other side of the call option is obliged to deliver the underlying asset if the buyer calls upon the option. For this obligation he receives the option premium from the buyer of the option. So obviously having this option is beneficial. It's always beneficial to own an option because you can use it to derive value but you don't have to. So whenever market situation, market circumstances are disadvantages for your option you simply do not exercise the option. And if you buy an option, you don't even have to tell anyone that you do not exercise it. You have to actively exercise the option. As long as you don't do anything, being the buyer, nothing happens. And if the option expires, well, after that, it's too late. So this has an inherent value because you may receive something your upside is strictly positive or equal to zero, while your downside holding the option, having bought the option, is always zero. Once you have the option, you can't lose money with the option. The worst that can happen is you choose not to exercise the option. And that's why the option has a price. And the seller of the option 
receives that price for transferring the right described in the first bullet to the buyer of the option. So that's a call option. Let's look at a graph of the payout profile for a long call. So this is the payoff profile for a buyer of a call option. At the top, you see the payout for a long call, which is equal to max ST minus EP, semicolon zero minus C. What does this mean? You see it in the graph below. ST again is the spot price at maturity for the underlying. So S capital T is the spot price at maturity at the last date the option can be exercised. EP is the exercise price or the strike price and C is the option premium. So what do we see in this formula? We have max over S T minus EP. So spot price minus exercise price. So if this is positive, if the spot price ST is above the exercise price, then the holder of the option will exercise the option. Why? Well, because he has the right to buy something for EP, which he or she can sell for ST. And as soon as ST is above EP, it's valuable to exercise the option. Okay, so that's ST minus EP. But why do we say max ST minus EP or zero? Because, as we said, it may well happen that ST is below EP. However, in that case, we choose not to exercise the option and the payoff is zero. So again, that's my point here. The option value is strictly positive, bounded to zero, or is weakly positive. It's either zero or positive. It can never be negative. And that's why we have the minus C there, because we have to pay for the right to hold this option. Otherwise, of course, nobody would give you such an option. Okay, and in the main part of the graph, we see on the horizontal axis ST, the spot price, which can be anywhere here depicted positively in electricity, it can even be negative, but here depicted from zero to some very large value. And if we look in red at the payoff profile of the long call, then that stays at minus C for very low spot prices, because then we choose not to exercise the option. Our payoff from the option is zero, but we already paid C for the right to have the option. So our payoff is minus C until ST is exactly equal to EP. Until the spot price is exactly equal to the exercise price EP. In that point, we are indifferent between exercising and not exercising the option. If we exercise it, well, we buy something for EP, which we can then sell for ST. If they're identical, profit is zero, or we choose not to exercise, profit is zero. It becomes interesting at EP and to the right. As soon as we are just one euro cent to the right of EP, we are, as you see at the bottom, in the money. We choose to exercise the option. And we then receive an ST, which by definition now is greater than EP. And the difference is what we earn from exercising the option. And then for the total payout, we still have to deduct C. That's why even if we're exercising directly around EP or to the right of EP, we're still in the negative because we start at minus C exercising. And at EP plus C, 
in terms of the spot price. So as soon as the spot price at maturity exceeds EP plus C, we are making revenues from the option. So that's the payout profile for a long call. And such an option can, of course, be used on electricity markets and also on gas markets and even on CO2 certificate markets. How does it look like for a short call? So from the perspective of a seller of a call option. Well, this is mirroring the payoff for the buyer of a call option. Please briefly consider for yourself on what axis you are actually mirroring this profile. Okay, if we just describe it and go directly into this, you see in the blue line that as long as the option is out of the money, so ST, spot price at maturity, is below or equal to EP, from the perspective of the seller of the option, this is what you're hoping for. Because then you received the option premium C, which is your payoff, but the buyer of the option is not exercising the option, so you do not have to do anything once you or after you sold the option. So you, you receive the option premium, but the option is not exercised, you don't have any additional costs. So as long as the option is out of the money for you being the seller of a call option, it's very attractive because you can keep the full option premium. So this is what you are aiming for if you're selling the option. And then once price ST, spot price at maturity, exceeds EP, you run into losses because you sold the call and the buyer of the call is now exercising the option. And you have to deliver at cost EP or at a price of EP, a good which is now worth on the market more than EP. Either you have it, then you have opportunity costs, because you could, of course, instead of delivering it now at EP to the buyer of the option, you could sell on the wholesale market yourself. Or if you don't own the good, that's even more striking or more easy to understand, then you actually have to buy it to be able to hand it over to the buyer of the option. And then you buy at an ST, which exceeds EP, uh, and sell at EP at the strike price of the option, at the exercise price of the option, to the buyer of the call option. So, and of course, the higher ST is, the bigger your loss will be. So once the option is in the money, it is exercised, and you, being the seller of a call option, start to lose money. The payout, of course, can also be described in a formula. You see this on the top of the slide. So the payout for a short call is equal to min EP minus ST or zero plus C. Okay, that's a call option. So the call option has a buyer and the call option has a seller. Okay, here you see the two in combination, short call, long call. So the buyer of the option, as we introduced in one of our previous videos in this course, is long on the call. So that's the long call, the perspective of the buyer. In red, starting at minus C, and then at EP, if spot price rises above EP, you start to make a gain profit contribution, while in blue the perspective of the seller of the call, short call, starting at plus C because this seller sold the option for a revenue of C. But then if the spot price at maturity 
increases above EP, the option is exercised against you. You have to deliver something which is more valuable and you start to make losses. That was the first option type, the call option. Similar but different is the so-called put option, which also has a buyer and the seller. The buyer of a put option has the right, but not the obligation, to sell a certain underlying asset at a predetermined price, the exercise price or strike price, and at a predetermined quantity within a certain period, that's an American option, or at a certain point in time, that's a European option. So difference, what's different for the put? The put gives you the right to sell. And of course, also this right to sell, which again is having a positive value. In the worst case, you do not choose to exercise your put option, meaning your right to sell something. Worst case is you choose not to exercise it. Best case is, yes, you do exercise, especially if the spot price is very low, spot price at maturity, then it's very nice to have this option to sell at a relatively high price. And then you receive a positive profit. So again, the put is inherently positive in value, zero or positive. And thus we again have the situation that the seller of the put option wants to be compensated with an option premium because the seller of the put is waiting for the buyer, whether the buyer chooses to exercise the option, which is bad for the seller or not. And then the seller well, can only keep the full uh, option premium. So the seller of the option is obliged to buy the underlying asset if the buyer of the put option chooses so. For this obligation, he receives the option premium from the buyer of the option. Let's look at the payout profile for a long put first. So this is from the perspective of the buyer of a put option. Starting again with the figure, you see here that the lower the spot price is, the more attractive it is to own this option. So you see here in the red, in the very left, where spot price at maturity is very low or even zero, you see that the payoff is very high. The red line starts very high, um, close to the vertical axis. So at a spot price of zero, that is great news because what you can do being the buyer of a put option, you can buy the asset, the underlying asset for zero or very low prices and exercise your put option to sell it for EP. So this is very attractive. However, the higher the spot price gets, the less attractive this becomes. So if, for example, here the exercise price is 20 euros, if the spot price is zero, that's excellent news. You buy something for zero, you essentially get it for free and choose to exercise your option, selling it for 20. You get the full difference of 20 as profit. If the price at maturity, the spot price at maturity, however, rises to 10 euros, you still exercise your option. You buy something for 10, sell it for 20, you have 10 euros as profit contribution, but you still have to pay the C, of course, in both cases, uh, the option premium. Uh, but point here is your revenue is already lower. If 
the spot price at maturity is 20 equal to your exercise price, then again, you're indifferent between exercising your put and not exercising your put. You can buy something for 20, which you could also alternatively buy. Uh, sorry, you can sell something for 20 via the put, which you could alternatively also sell for 20 on the spot market. So you can do it, but you don't have to. There is no point doing it, essentially. So for any price to the right of EP, so greater or equal to EP, you do not exercise the option and you lose the option premium C. So your payoff is minus C if the spot price is greater or equal to EP. All right, and the payout, the formula you see on top, payout long put equal to max EP minus ST or zero minus C. So what does this tell us? Again, you have bought the put, so you cannot get less than, than zero. That's what the max zero implies. So you, either you choose to get zero or you get a positive number. So you get EP minus ST if and only if it is a positive value. And again, we said, well, you buy for ST, that's your cost here, minus ST, and you have the right to sell for EP. And the bigger this difference is, the higher the payout for the long put is. Okay, again, the perspective of the seller of the put option. So a short put. Short put is again a mirrored payout profile. Again, think about what the mirroring axis is. Is it the horizontal axis or is it the vertical axis? You will find this out quite easily. And again, the payout in a way is reversed because here, What's bad from the perspective of the seller of the put is if the put is exercised and that's the case at very low spot prices. So the lower the spot price, the bigger the loss for the seller of the put option. And if the price rises to at least EP minus C, you start to make a profit. At exactly EP minus C, you received the premium C, but uh, the buyer of the option is exercising the put option and essentially you're losing C. So at a spot price of EP minus C, you exactly break even. And for any spot price above EP minus C, you receive a positive total aggregated payout. If the price rises to EP, the option is even no longer exercised and you can keep the full option premium C. The formula is payout is equal to min ST minus EP zero plus C. So here, of course, from the in the first part of the sum, you can only lose. If the option is exercised, the buyer of the option is going to do that if and only if it costs you money. So not to cause you harm, but because that's essentially the other side of the coin from the buyer's perspective where he makes money. So the option is only exercised if the buyer of the option makes a profit, which inherently and immediately translates into a loss for the seller of the option. So either you lose money or at best you have a zero, you don't have any payouts because the option is not exercised. But again, you're compensated for this not favorable first part of the sum with the option premium C, the second part of the sum. Okay, here is how the two payout profiles look like. Short put in blue, long put in red. And again, you see that they're exactly mirrored and by now at the latest, it should be pretty easy to see what the mirroring axis is. Okay, the summary for call and put options. 
We have long position buying an option and you can buy both the call option in the middle and the put option on the right. If you buy a call option, you have a long call. If you buy a put option, you have a long put. And the payout profiles for these two are different, of course, and have already been discussed. And then there is the short position selling of an option. If you sell a call option, you have a short call. And if you sell a put option, you have a short put. And now, please, because this can be a little confusing, please take a minute, stop the video and reflect why all four payout profiles differ. So the long call is different from the long put, is different from the short call, is different from the short put. All four payout profiles are different. Okay, and we have a relationship in the lower table between the spot price at maturity of the underlying and the exercise price EP. If the spot price at maturity is bigger, larger than the exercise price, the call option is in the money, the put option is out of the money. If the spot price at maturity time t is below the exercise price, the call option is out of the money, the put option is in the money, and if ST is equal to EP, both types of options are at the money. Okay, now combining what we said in the very first part of today's video, the spark spreads, the dark spreads, the clean spark spread, the clean dark spread, we can see this as options. We have already introduced spark spreads, dark spreads and clean spreads. These spreads, we said, are traded as non-standard electricity options. For example, the buyer of a European spark or dark spread call option written on fuel G, natural gas for the spark, hard coal for the dark, at a fixed heat rate KH, has the right but not the obligation to pay at the option's maturity the specified fuel costs and receive the price of electricity. The payoff pi at maturity time t is pi is equal to max st minus kh times gt and zero, where st and gt are again the electricity and fuel prices at time t. Note that this is essentially the financial replication of a physical power plant's payoff profile. So in particular, please think about the optionality. Why do I say a power plant's payoff profile here has this optionality? Take a moment to consider this. Please stop the video for this. Okay, continuing with clean spreads, similar setup to spark and dark spreads, but also including costs for CO2, we already said. The order of European clean spark dark spread call option, here again written as an, or seeing this as an option, written on fuel G at a fixed heat rate KH has the right, but not the obligation, to pay at the option's maturity time the fuel price and receive the price of one unit of electricity. So this option essentially converts fuel costs into electricity. The payoff pi at maturity time t is pi is equal to max st minus kh times gt plus eco2 times ct and zero. Where ECO2 again is the emission factor, ST and GT are the electricity and fuel prices, and CT is the CO2 emission allowance price at time T. 
So this already is slightly more complicated, but again, the max over this first part and zero is the optionality. You can never fall below zero holding this option. And your payoff, if it's positive, depends on the electricity price, ST. The higher that is, the better, hopefully, the difference to KH, your generation costs KH times GT plus ECO2 times CT is positive. But if it's negative, if ST is below KH times GT plus ECO2 times CT, well then you simply choose not to exercise and receive zero. So that's the clean spread option. Another type even slightly more complex is so-called swing options. Swing options give the holder the right to exercise an option over a certain period of time. For example, a year with 8,760 hours at a predetermined number of times, for example, 3,000 hours. This makes swing options suitable for evaluating power plants that have, for example, a gas supply contract that stipulates a gas quantity for a certain number of production hours. Sometimes a power plant has agreed upon uh, a gas supply contract where the plant guarantees to take off a certain amount of gas. Here, for example, between so, uh, enough gas for between 5,000 and 7,000 full load hours so that the seller of the gas contract has a certain quantity guaranteed. So the volume risk here is in part at least shifted to the power plant. Okay, that's swing options. So you're allowed to exercise this option during a certain amount of the year. <coughs> Okay, that was an introduction to options already, as I said, very empirically put in the setting of energy. Now let's continue hedging with options. And I say this upfront, this includes some parts where we go back to um, a sales portfolio. So where we have an energy utility with retail businesses as well. We will in part look at what's the risk and how can it be managed with options from the perspective of retail business. So here we go in a very small part beyond generation assets only, but we will come back to generation assets. Okay, let's start with this. Covering a sale, there are various possibilities to balance a forward sale that has just been made. So come back to what we said in the last video. Assume you sold a certain amount of energy to an industrial customer. What can you do now on the procurement side? What can you do to get the energy, regardless of whether it's electricity or gas? You can, number one, instantly procure on this on the futures market that would then again be this back-to-back -back procurement no risk no chance you can procure on the spot market which is maximizing both risk and chance you can hedge with options and there it becomes relevant what we just discussed you can hedge yourself with a zero cost collar we will come back to that later or you can implement a combination of different measures let's look at how the payoff profiles would look like here the number one instant coverage at the futures market so you sell and you immediately buy on the futures market so what you have is you have a price of the forward sale Let's say in this example here, it's 55.8 euros per megawatt hour. And then you buy immediately for a price of F purchase. Let's say it's 55.75 euros per megawatt hour. 
That's the price of the forward purchase. And the payout then is the difference between the sale and the purchase. That's your payout. Number two, full coverage at the spot market. Here you beautifully see how much chance and how much risk this implies. You, so you sell for F sale, again assume it's 55.80. However, you do not immediately buy forward, but you wait and later on buy at maturity on the spot market. And then here, illustratively, the price on the spot market can be between zero and essentially infinity. And your payout again is F sale mean minus ST. And this ST can now be zero, which would give you a dramatic profit contribution, of course. Then you can keep all of F sale. So you sold something for 55.80 and you buy it for free or at a very low price. That's the best case. You see this on the left, you have very high profits. And then the price, depending on what ST actually is, uh, goes up and here your profit goes down until at 55.8 in the spot price, your profit is zero. And then if the spot price is above 55.8, well, then you have sold something for 55.8, but you have to rebuy it at a higher price. You start making losses. That's why if you do full coverage at the spot market, you buy everything on the spot market. You have this uh, 45 degree line, which goes from a profit at low spot prices into significant losses at negative spot prices. Of course, the different prices are not equally likely, right? I hope you understand that I'm using the example of zero euros per megawatt hour just for illustrative purposes, because it's quite easy to bring the point across. Um, but of course, it's neither likely that the price for this product drops to zero, uh, nor that it increases to infinity. That's just um, more or less theoretical cases, but we can have periods with very low prices. So there is a significant volatility. Remember when we had the chapter uh, on the wholesale market, uh, wholesale prices are volatile and especially between the forward trade periods price and the spot price can be significant price movements. Okay, so this is payoff in case number two. Completely different, right? Case number one, no risk, guaranteed payoff of 0 0.5 euros per megawatt hour in this example. And here, number two, case number two, lots of risk, lots of chance. Okay, let's move on. Case number three, a little bit more complex here. We hatch with the call option. So here, what we do is we sell for 55.80. And on top, at the same point in time, at the time small t, when we do the forward sale, we also choose to buy an option. For, in this example, an option premium of 2 euros 60. So we pay that premium and the option has a strike price EP of 65 euros per megawatt hour. And the payoff profile for the long call is again included here. It's horizontal until EP. And then if the spot price is above EP, we exercise our call and we receive money from the call. Interestingly, now, the total payoff profile is simply the sum of the forward or actually of the spot purchase in the end, F sale minus ST plus 
the payout of the call. So we have this 45 degree line you see here in the dashed red and the long call payoff in the solid red. And the payout, the total payout for the two contracts is obviously just the sum and we can analyze, quantify and look at the sum. So this is here the total combined payout beautifully put at the bottom total payout is F sale minus SP capital T plus max SPT minus EP and zero minus option premium C. And this is here in the bold solid red line. So what happens is we have a positive profit if the spot price is low. However, we do not receive what we had in case two anymore because the new red solid profit line is below the historical one you remember from, from case two because we have to pay C the option premium. So essentially, when prices are below EP, we receive what we used to receive in case two without buying the option, but we also bought the option, so our payoff is lower. And then at EP, the advantage of the option kicks in. If the spot price rises above EP, we exercise the option and receive a positive payoff. And interestingly, you see that our payoff profile here becomes horizontal. Why is that? Well, because for every euro increased value to the right of EP, we gain one euro from the option, from exercising the option, while we lose one euro from the spot price. So essentially, we are completely flat. We don't have any price risk if the price risk, if the price is greater than EP in this example, 65 euros per megawatt hour. So that's how to explain the payoff profile if we hatch with the call option. Unfortunately, these numbers are not totally off. So hedging with an option is pretty expensive. So you buy two point or you pay two euros 60 cents to essentially be protected for a price rise above 65 euros, which of course is an increase of nearly 10 euros from the 55.80 you observed in the forward contract when you made the forward deal. But it's, an, it's a nice construct here, uh, beautiful, beautiful showing how you can use call options to hedge procurement. Okay, number four is the so-called zero cost caller. Here, the first part, zero cost callers have essentially two parts. The first part, again, is the long call just described. So we want to hedge against rising prices because rising prices would mean we have to pay more on the spot market when we buy the commodity we sold on the forward market. So the call helps for that. Here again, you see um, the excellent or the positive uh, payout at very high spot prices. That's exactly helping us when we have to buy. So on the one hand, then we pay more on the spot market. At the same time, um, the call hedges against that increase. However, here again, the problem, so to say, we have to pay two euro 60 in terms of option premium. And that money has to be spent. And the idea of the zero cost caller is that we avoid these costs of two years 60 from the option premium for the call by selling 
a put at the same option premium to year 60. So we sell a put on top of buying the call. So to finance the call, we sell the put. And you see this here beautifully. We sell a put for tier year 60, roughly at a strike price of 50 euros per megawatt hour. And of course, now for selling the put, we receive the premium C, that's plus. But as we said, there is no free lunch. We pay for this put when prices are very low, because then the buyer of the put, our counterparty, is exercising the put and selling to us at EP and we could buy for ST below EP, but unfortunately we have to take it for EP. But here you see that the two premia cancel each other out and we now have a combined payout profile which is equal to blue plus red. And if we indeed do this, then you see very nicely that between the two strike prices, EP put and EP call, our payoff is zero. The call brings a positive payoff to the right of 65. So if the spot price is greater than 65, we get a positive profit contribution. However, in a way we pay for that with the loss of the put if the strike price drops below 50 euros per megawatt hour because there we're going to lose money from the put. To give three examples for, for this strategy, so the zero cost collar strategy in procurement, if we first of all look in isolation at the zero cost collar, If the market price rises above the exercise price of the call option, the call is exercised. If the market price falls below the exercise price of the put option, the put is exercised. And again, the strike price of the call is 65, as you see in the table below in the third column. And the strike price for the put is 50 euros, as you see in the Uh, second to right column and there we have in the second column three exemplary market prices so in example one market price is 60 euros per megawatt hour strike price 65 means call is exercised or call is not exercised The buyer of the call, in this example us, has the right but not the obligation to pay one megawatt hour of electricity at 65 euros. But the market price is just 60 euros. So would we exercise our call option? No, wouldn't make any sense. So no payments from the call. In the zero cost collar strategy, we sold the put at a strike price of 50. We sold the put, so we have to wait for the decision of the put's buyer. Will the buyer of the put with the strike price of 50 exercise the put and sell electricity to us at a price of 50 euros per megawatt hour? at the agreed strike price? No, wouldn't make any sense from the perspective of the put buyer because the market price is 60. So it's way more attractive to not exercise the right of selling for 50 and instead sell at the market price of 60. And that's why neither the call nor the put are exercised and the total profit or loss is zero. Different situation 
in an exemplary spot market price of maturity capital T of 70 euros. Here we choose to exercise the call. We approach the seller of the call who sold to us and tell this person, agency, bank, uh, whatsoever, yes, please deliver electricity for 65 euros instead of buying ourselves for 70. While the person holding the put we sold is not approaching us because here that person is now even better off selling for 70 at the wholesale market instead of selling to us for 50. So the total profit from our zero cost caller in this example is 5 euros per megawatt hour. Example number three, assume the price in the spot market at maturity has dropped to 45 euros per megawatt hour. Will we exercise our strike for the call? No, because we could buy for 65, but buying at 45 is much more attractive for us. So we won't exercise the call option. How about the person we sold the put to? Will that person exercise the put? Yes. Now that person will exercise the put. Why? Because now that person can sell to us for 50, which now for the first time is above the 45 of the market price. So this now is attractive. You prefer to sell for 50. Assume financially that person, just virtually and for easiest convenience, that person has not any other means to get the electricity and has just a purely financial interest. Then what that person would do, exercise the put, sell to us for 50 and buy on the market for 45. So that person, the holder of the put, would make a profit of five. However, again, we as the seller of the put with our zero cost collar put sale, make now a loss of five euros. Okay, and now if we combine this payoff profile for the zero cost collar, you see here in the dashed line, increasing first, then staying flat, and then increasing again. Combining this, so simply adding this to the purchase at the spot market profile, you see here again in the angled 45 degrees line, that then in combination gives the total payoff profile for the zero cost color, and that looks like this. Here, if the spot price at maturity is very low, we are at the very left here at low spot prices, then we have a profit of 5.8 euros. Because below 50, our profit does not keep rising because the put is exercised and every additional euro we receive virtually from the negative spot price procurement is needed to compensate the buyer of the put. So we receive 5 euro 80 until the put strike price EP put of 50. And then from there, if price increases further, we go down horizontally because uh, sorry, we go down 45 degrees because neither the put nor the call is exercised. We go through our sales price of 55.8 exactly because at a spot price of 55.8, neither the call nor the put is exercised. We buy for 55.8, we sold for 55.8, exactly zero profit. If the price then rises further, we do not have the call or the put exercised until 65. Um, but we pay more for the electricity, so our payoff becomes negative. And then at 65, we exercise the call and are essentially hatched for any additional increase in prices. So this also is an interesting product here. Uh, essentially, by selling the puts, we compensa compensate the costs for buying the call. 
but we have to give up the gain from low prices in order to protect ourselves for very high spot price risks. And again, you see, unfortunately, in the empirical settings, this is not symmetric. So if you buy and sell, you have already learned there is the bid ask spread, which has to be covered and for options, which are relatively illiquid products, that's significant. So unfortunately, you would prefer to be in the middle here at least, but F sale is closer to EP put than it is to EP call. So here you see you still have a little bit more downside risk than you have uh, upside potential. But still, again, zero cost color as an interesting product to hedge against price movements while still keeping a certain upside and downside. So if you just want to limit your risk, and this is actually what some financial players do whenever they enter a new market. They say, look, we want to take risk in a certain bandwidth, typically much larger than this, but they want to, um, they're not that interested in the very, very extreme risk events, like earthquakes, stuff like that. So like literally, uh, not literally, but uh, figuratively, uh, extreme risk which do something extraordinary to the market, which could not really be foreseen and they do not want to quantify. So they just sell the put at a very high limit because they say if it's if it's very extreme what happens here, uh, this is not what we want to do business with while buying the call to hedge on the other side. So this is something which is actually implemented by large financial players when they want to um, engage a market. Okay, so the zero cost color strategy in procurement to sum up, current market price 55.80, minimum from the put is 50, maximum from the call is 65, Costs of the option is zero because we had plus 260 minus 260 exactly cancels each other out. The conclusion, financing the call option with a higher strike price by selling a put option with a lower strike price. In return for hedging against rising electricity prices, which would be bad for our portfolio, the benefits from falling electricity prices, which would be good for our portfolio, must be given up to compensate for the call costs. Okay, concluding on options and option valuation in particular, some basics we have to differentiate between the intrinsic value for options, which is the current market price of the underlying minus the exercise price. That is the payoff of the option if it was exercised immediately. So that's the difference between the current market price and the exercise price. That's the intrinsic value, which can be zero or positive. And then we have the extrinsic value, which is the time and volatility value. That's the value resulting from, I say, and this is important, the asymmetry of the payoff profile. Your potential payoff is asymmetric, meaning here that the value resulting from the fact that the option could go deeper into the money until T. So your payoff could become much better, but at the same time has limited downward risk as option payoff cannot become negative. So in a way, holding an option volatility and risk, so volatility more, it's a better term here, is positive for you. The more fluctuation there is, the more chance you have for very high reward, 
while your downward risk is always limited at zero. And thus, an option has an extrinsic value component. So please remember and think about it for a moment. The option value is never simply determined by checking the underlying price and the exercise price. This does not do justice to the asymmetric uh, optionality you have. You have the right, but not the obligation. So this extrinsic value component for time and volatility is a second value component, and it's not clear which one is bigger. If the intrinsic value already is very big, then the extrinsic value is lower. If, however, the, ex ex the intrinsic value sorry, is zero, uh, then the extrinsic value can still be significant and can make up, of course, 100% of the total option value. So the total value of the option is sim simply the sum of the two, intrinsic value plus extrinsic time and volatility value. So what drives an option price? One thing is, of course, the price of the underlying. A call option becomes more attractive with an increase in the price. The option price increases with the price of the underlying. So if the underlying price rises, then the option price rises. Put option becomes less attractive, so the option price decreases if the underlying price rises. That's one driver. Second driver is the exercise price. The higher the exercise price, the lower the probability that a call option will be in the money in capital T. The price of a call option decreases with increasing exercise price. The price of a put option increases with the exercise price. Another value factor is the remaining contract duration. The value of an option decreases with decreasing remaining contract duration. The probability of an increase in the intrinsic value decreases. So if time passes, it becomes less likely that this asymmetric payoff profile of the option has enough time to move in your direction into the holder's perspective from the holder's perspective, and thus the option value decreases. Last but not least, we have volatility. With increasing volatility of the price of the underlying, the option price increases. The probability of an increase of the intrinsic value increases. So the more volatility, the higher the chance that we will get a positive outcome in the end. Taking these factors together, there are analytical models to determine the value of an option. And one of the most common models is the so-called black scolds model. This is an analytical formula to evaluate options. Here we have an example for a European call option. The call options value, depending on the price of the underlying S at time T, is equal to S times N from D1, where N is the distribution function of the standard normal distribution, and D1 is defined below, minus K times E to the power of minus R times capital T minus T times N, again, distribution function of the normal standard distribution uh, of D2 and the expression D2 again is given below. This is analytically true if and only if 
the price movement follows a standard normal distribution, which is in reality rarely the case. Nonetheless, because this formula can be easily implemented in Excel or in a pocket calculator or on your mobile phone or whatsoever, uh, there were in the uh, well, in the last century, there were actually pocket calculators which just had a button uh, to press and then you got the option value. So this formula is may look complicated to a student hearing about it for the first time, but it's straightforward and still relatively simple. Uh, and it gives analytically precise the value of an option if you can determine all the parameters inside. In particular, if you can determine the standard deviation sigma in here. You see in D1 and in D2, you see the sigma component, the standard deviation. Uh, and you have to know this. Okay, so that's an analytical formula. As I said, it's called the black scotes model, uh, but Merton is another uh, economist who came up with it at roughly the same time. So this is a way to quantify an option. There is other ways. We will discuss two simulation methods later on, but this here is an analytical approach. Some side remarks on the Black-Scotes model. The theory was published in 1973 by, as we said, Fisher Black, Mert Scotts, uh, and R.C. Merton. These three independently, like Black Scotes together and Merton somewhat independently, came up with it. The theory quickly gained influence. Scotes and Merton were awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1997. Unfortunately, Black died in 1995. And as the Nobel Prize cannot be awarded posthumously, uh, he didn't receive it. But otherwise, it's extremely likely that he would also be uh, in Stockholm receiving the prize. In 1998, however, Scolds and Merton failed spectacularly as directors of the hedge fund LTCM, Long Term Capital Management due to liquidity risks. They had a hedge fund uh, and well, obviously, if you are a Nobel Prize winner, then people with money believe you know what you're doing. So they attracted lots of money, which they tried to convert into even more money, applying some finance principles involving optionality. However, unfortunately, there was at some point in 1998 a very quick market movement and they failed to be able to switch positions fast enough. So here, beautifully, this is an example of liquidity risk. We discussed before liquidity measures how fast and at what costs you can enter and leave financial positions. And here in this example in 1998, the market was very illiquid. So it became very hard or virtually impossible to change positions. And that was what led to the bankruptcy of this hedge fund. And this was pretty major financial catastrophe. Greenspan uh, had to lower the US federal funds rate just based on this bankruptcy. And the owners were replaced by a bailout of 3.75 billion US dollars. So a vast amount of money was needed to correct this. So this, of course, shows that these guys are brilliant, but they still failed in practice maybe giving hope that it may work the other way around. You may be successful in practice, even if you're not brilliant in theory. Okay, so that's an analytical model. I said there is two other approaches I would like to discuss and two 
numerical models. The first is binomial model and the second um, is going to be Monte Carlo simulation. So in a binomial model first, we also use this to evaluate option prices. So we construct decision trees starting at t equal to zero when the price of the underlying equals p0. And then, as you already see on the graph, possible price development path during the remaining lifetime of the option, they can go up from starting in p0 by a factor of u or go down, decrease by a factor of d at the end of each period. That's a binomial model which allows exactly these two cases. So if you look at the graph, we start in P0 and we can go up U times P0 or down D times P0. And then in a second step, we can again go up, which is U square up up times P0, or we can go up and down, which is ud p0 or we can go down and up and end in the same point d u p0 or we can go down down d square p0 okay and then we allocate a probability for every price development scenario and the fair option value the intrinsic value of the option is the sum of the discounted values so in the end, at the very right, for each scenario, we determine A, a price, and B, a likelihood. And then we can see where do we, in, in effect, have positive prices and what's the likelihood to end there. And then we can determine the fair option value. Common routine calculates, for example, 30 periods, which already means 1.07 billion possible price path. Uh, because it goes, uh, it, it grows exponentially. Okay, the binomial model in more detail, the dimension of the price increase, decrease, as well as the probabilities are dependent on the price volatility of the underlying, which is sigma, as we said, and that's the standard deviation, as well as on the period duration, capital T. So the factor of a price increase thus can be expressed as u is equal to e to the, to the power of sigma times square root of delta T. And the factor of the price decrease is d equal to 1 divided by u, because if we multiply u and d, so if we go up and down or down and up, we want to end in the same point by definition here. And thus, in order to achieve this, d must be equal to 1 divided by u, because then u times d is exactly u times 1 divided by u, which is 1, which then is at the same point. Okay, the probabilities probability for an increase is equal to e to the power of r times delta t minus d divided by u minus d and the probability p for a decrease is 1 minus p increase. Numerical example if you look at this European call option on natural gas future price in t equals 0 is 20 euros per MVR thermal exercise price ep 22 euros per megawatt hour, volatility sigma 35%, interest rate R 5%, remaining duration capital T is three months, time of one period, delta T is one month, which is 0 0.08333 years. And we calculate the parameters according to the formula given above. U is equal to E to the power of sigma times square root of delta T is equal to 1.1063 and d is equal to 1 divided by u, which is equal to 0 0.9039. And the probabilities, p increase, is 0 0.4954, and p decrease is 0 0.5046. 
And now if we implement this, here you see how this looks like if we go up with probability p and down and so on. And here is one example how we come up with the 22.13 is equal to f0, so the 20 times u square times d is equal to 20 times 1.063 square times 0 0.9039, which is equal to 22.13. Okay, and if we convert these payoffs on the right, or these uh, total payoffs on the right, to the option payouts, then we subtract the option strike price of 22 uh, and thus the 2708 minus 22 gives us 5.08 the 22.13 minus 22 gives us 0 0.13 the 18.08 minus 22 watch out does not gives us give us minus something but that gives us zero Again, the asymmetric payoff profile of the option kicks in. We cannot make any losses out of the option. So as soon as the difference between strike and reside from the binomial tree becomes negative, we cap it at zero. So both the 18.08 minus 22 and the 14.77, uh, here the max zero kicks in and they are both corrected to zero. So we have here on the right, beautifully, the payoff profile, 5.08, 0 0.13, 0 and 0. And then if we convert that uh, to the payoff, we get a result of 0 0.66 as the correct value of the option based on the binomial tree calculation. We will work on this more in the exercise. Okay, and the last numerical model I would like to present is the so-called Monte Carlo simulation. The process is as follow, establish a stochastic process to generate a random time series of prices with the desired characteristics. So we need a price process. Second, calculate one random price path. So you assume that following the specifications of one, you essentially draw one price path. And then for that particular price path, you calculate the intrinsic value of the option at the time of maturity capital T. Then you discount the intrinsic value to the current point in time t equal to zero. And then you repeat this process from two to four several thousand times. And number six, the fair option price equals the arithmetic average of the discounted intrinsic values you calculated here. So you calculate several thousand, let's say 10,000 different outcomes based on your stochastic characteristics by calculating, randomly drawing 10,000 different price paths. For every of the 10,000 price paths, you have a potential outcome. And then you calculate how much that would give you on average um, assessing the value of the option. Okay, if we do this numerical example, example variation of a call, current future price F0, 35 euros, exercise price EP, 35.50, remaining duration capital T, 500 days, and the stochastic process we describe as geometric Brownian motion with the following characteristics, volatility uh, sigma, 2% per day, time steps delta T, one day, discount rate R, 4%, and we visit the exercise for further details. So 
If you officially register for this course with us, you have an exercise, a tutorial, where we now look at the specifics of this. Here you just see uh, random price path calculations, beautifully put here, simply generated, positive part, and then discount the intrinsic values. And that's how you calculate these values. Thanks for watching this part.